So we're going to talk a little bit about creativity. All of you have very different career trajectories and work in very different uh, cultures at your respective companies. So I'd like to first just have you give us a brief, very brief introduction on just how you see creativity and what you see the importance of creativity is with your specific work group. Um, well, I was thinking about the about creativity and and humans. Um, so I think that as humans, we're all we all create. Whether you're creating a narrative, whether you're creating um, an opportunity for someone, or whether you're creating um, a spreadsheet. Uh, so I think I really believe that everybody in this room and on, and on the planet as humans, um, we are creative. And what I think is really interesting about the events industry and the experiences space is that we are bringing together humans and um, allowing for a way for us to all share together, like our values, and, and to share our abilities to create opportunities, our own narratives, and to even create like a shared story together. And that's really, um, I think, at the heart of what I'm doing at Happily. Um, it's really funny because I've been in the events business my entire career, but I now find myself as like a technologist, which is a, it's a very different, um, it's a very a different skill set. Um, and so really with, um, with my job and where I feel like I'm applying my creativity is, is in how do I understand all the humans that we interact with that happily people who are, we've got over 50,000 freelancers in our network and we continue to grow. So how do, how do I understand where everybody is in their trajectory as, as an events professional? How do we get them to where they wanna be? Um, and how do we match them with the, the right clients and organizations uh, to achieve their goals, their creative goals for bringing people together. Great, thank mm -hmm. you. How in your group at Happily, how do you ignite innovation? How do you get these massive amounts of people that you're starting to pull together to really find their best self and bring their creative self forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, innovation um, and when you're going through with, with clients and trying to help them figure out what can they do new and different is actually starting by identifying, well, what is different? Uh, what's already been done, uh, seeing where the opportunity is uh, and where those gaps are, um, and then bringing lots of uh, different perspectives to the table and different options um, for, uh, for them to s sort of fill that gap. Um, I, I think about it in terms of teams, and so I'm really proud of the fact that um, we have the, the largest network of freelance planners, that's cool, but the most interesting thing is that we have the most diverse network of freelance planners. Um, and so that, that, um, that diversity actually allows, I believe that that's, that's really where innovation really stems from, because um, if you have the same type of person coming, or if it's just you coming back time after time after time again, and you're not refreshing your team, then your, uh, your events and your ideas are gonna always be a little bit siloed and a little bit more stale than if you were to bring new people to the table. Mm -hmm. Say so taking something that's done in a different industry and figuring out how to apply it to yours and how does that change the game for whoever your customer may be? Absolutely. Sarah, same question for you. Where do you, what's your, what's your secret sauce? <laughs> um, I love humans and it really comes from, I, I surround myself um, with a lot of artists and musicians and I find a lot of inspiration from them. I think just because the, the sheer nature of being an artist is they're, they're constantly sort of like looking at the world and understanding it through their lens and processing it and then putting it back out in a communicable way where they can express themselves and express humanity. So I find that that's actually very, looking at them and their work, um, but also talking with them and learning about their process is, is really informative for what I do in the event space. So this rat race that we're in, we're all in this time crunch. You know, you get an RFP and it's like, turn it around in 48 hours and I need this conference tomorrow, even though it wasn't in our business plan a week ago. How do we work as a group to make sure that this, this roadblock that we have of time doesn't make us sacrifice our creativity? How do we protect that? How do we make, how do we let people know that what we're doing is so important and there's so much strategy behind it and there's so many important values that we're trying to tell that we can't turn something around as quickly as you need it? I mean, Sarah, is there something, because your whole platform is built on like on bringing demand. people quickly, yeah. <laughs> but you also want it to be good, right? Um, I actually think that more constraints um, cause people to be more creative. So I think that when you have a, a deadline uh, and literally, you know, 
uh, yesterday I had a deadline of, of find me a lead producer who can come in for our 1,000 person, three day, three stage conference that's happening in less than 30 days. Um, <laughs> you know, and like these types of constraints um, or cons actually force us to get very, very specific about what works and what doesn't work why, and you have to defend it very quickly. Why does this work? Why does this not work? So I personally love a good deadline and I, and I, I love a low budget because it, it actually forces me to be more creative and because my client hasn't been prepared or isn't you know, equipped with all the resources, um, we can have a, a better conversation um, about what's possible um, then, then if there was like, oh, you can do everything you want and you have like two years to do it, then that's where I think it starts to get into like muck. So that one of the hardest things for us to sell as event producers yeah. is our ideas. I mean, we can sell our creativity, we can sell what it's gonna look like, but selling the value of the time and the effort and the resources, I mean, Sarah, even when we're talking about like the human capital that we're bringing to make these things yeah. happen, and Jody, you're talking about the strategy behind how you're driving an entire team's morale forward, like that takes talent, that takes people who yeah. understand not just how to put pretty flowers on a table, Absolutely. right? So how do we start to talk about that as a group? How do we educate the end person that what we're doing in the events field is there's some science to it and, th and there's a lot of professionalism and resources that goes into it. I, I mean, it's gonna be different for all of you because there's some internal kind of end user clients and then it certainly is. you have your own team, mm -hmm. but can you all speak to that a little bit? I think there's tension, you know, between this, this idea of like, we're the expert. Sometimes that's true and some parts of the stage of conceptualizing and executing an event and other times it's really not. Other times the client is the expert. And I think that, um, I think that the, actually I've found that um, I've been able to help people understand the science um, and respect the, the work that um, I do when I'm like EPing a show um, because I invite them into my process. I don't think that like, the way that I do things, I know that it is unique, um, the way that I've done it because my experience has been unique, but they're not precious to me where I feel like I can't share that with my client or with vendors and team um, so that like I make more money later on. Um, and I think that that's something that I've, I've definitely seen over the years in the event industry and, and something that I would you know really encourage everyone to sort of like rethink like how do you invite everybody into your process so that you can create a new process um, of getting things done for this particular project. So including your client, right? You're saying, I actually need to teach my client what my process is Every single to person. get them to really value it. Absolutely. Okay. Every single person. All right, so that's a problem, right? Because we just said the value of what we do is in that process and in building that creativity and bringing in all those ideas. And, Nobody just raised their hand. So maybe that's something that we all need to start thinking about a little bit is like share the knowledge that we have, share that professionalism, that process, because it, it doesn't need to be proprietary. It actually, when we share that, we might have a little bit of a chance of our clients and our, our colleagues and our companies understanding why these events are a little bit. Wow, more. yeah. That's where, we get the, yeah. that's where we get our ideas from, is from the, the people from creating that space. Event. Yes, you can't sell in what other people don't think is important or value, valuable. Uh, we bring the starter ideas, but yeah, we have to have them think that it is their idea too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're notorious for like, I think we, we've labeled it like stealing ideas from other people, but um, you know, it's, it's just really not the case. And there's actually, I was saying there's a TED, there's a TED talk um, from a woman, I think it's uh, Johanna is her first name. And um, she's a expert in, she studied the fashion industry and she actually showed that innovation in the fashion space skyrockets compared to other industries because of all of the counterfeit that's like happening and all the copycats in China and everything because it forces you to just like continue to innovate, innovate, innovate. So sharing your ideas, spreading them, you know, the way your secret sauce is just going to give, um, give you more ideas. You're going to get feedback um, and also push you to continue to like innovate and do something cool and different the next time. Carla, what do you think most people miss 
during the creative process? Like when your team's out there and they're chugging along and they're trying mm -hmm. to get everything done and throw all these ideas when you say you've either got no money or all the money, because it sounds like those are your two <laughs> ends of the spectrum. Oh yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually it's funny, you know, the question goes even certainly beyond my group and um, when I first heard the question, I immediately thought across industry. I believe what people miss the most, and I don't care if you're selling seashells by the seashore or content, this idea around, I don't think people, I, what I think people miss is the, the significance of the impact that critique has in ideation. And I mean from yourself and from your team, meaning if you're going to create a space for people to bring ideas to the table, not only it has to be safe, the critiquing can't happen up top. Yes, we'll figure out what's going to work, what's going to bubble to the top, what's priority, but you start shutting down people's creativity and their thoughts, they won't bring you a thing the next time. The same goes, and, and it's interesting, because I actually just had this conversation, the same goes with yourself. When you have an idea for you or an idea you want to bring or something you've thought of, you may critique that. It is damaging even for you to just start marking off before you even bring it to the table because there's something you wrote that someone else might build on or find a different viewpoint on. So I think what people miss the most is understand the large impact, the great impact that harsh critique can have in ideation with you or with your team. The, the exact opposite of creation is, it is. is destruction, right? And that's like exactly what you're pointing towards. I, I like that. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. S H E W E Y. And I, I think there's a difference between no and not yet, or maybe next yeah, time. You know, yeah. No isn't forever. That is one thing I've learned again and again and again. So I personally love that we've kind of over time created this library of ideas that, oh, hey, remember that thing we talked about doing two years ago? It's now possible because of this other thing. Let's, mm -hmm. let's resurrect that. Let's pursue that now. So it, it just keeping a pulse on all the ideas, even if they don't work for that particular event or at that moment in time or with that budget, hang on to it because it will have a place at some point. Can I just toss in? I've got one question for all of you, and then hopefully we can open it up because I think there are some people that are itching to ask a couple things in the audience. But mm -hmm. what is one thing that we need to stop doing right now that gets in the way of our own creativity? Maybe, Sarah, we can start with you. Like, what do people need to do to expand their horizons a little bit more? Um, I think that people need to stop thinking that creating is a solo experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and to start thinking, to start asking for feedback and inv inviting people in um, to the way that you think in your process, it'll just accelerate your creativity so much faster. If not, what, what would you say is one piece of parting advice for people when we're thinking about, you know, the live events field, the creative space, yeah, how do we kind of wrap this all together? Because I think one of the things that we try to do in this room and with this association is saying we're all so busy in our day jobs but if we don't take ourselves out of our day jobs and contribute back to our industry a little bit, it's going to be really hard to move it forward. And I mean, Sarah, like you're doing some game changing stuff in the field. Right? Like you're changing the way people actually staff their entire event model and run their companies. So how do we get other people to, to see the forest through the trees? I think that um, I think that it starts with having a really solid purpose um, the, the start with why, you know, um, I, I started I started happily because I didn't understand why I, I couldn't just ask my friends who ran other events companies to join and team up with me on TED. I was like, this is an amazing, you know, opportunity, but we have to like go through the staffing agency. Um, and that the, you know, for me really, the, the purpose of being able to, to break the walls and to sort of break the ownership of people what was and still is, you know, my motivator for um, for happily. And when I'm working with, um, I, I still I still do actually produce events because that's what I do. I'm, I'm better at that, I think, sometimes than building technology. But you know, um, like I, I'm I'm helping uh, Reed Hoffman uh, with uh, with a, a summit 
Um, he came out with this book, Blitzscaling, uh, last year, and he was like, oh, we, you know, him and his team, they're like, we want to do a forum, and I'm like, why? You know, do, do we really need more entrepreneurs, like, blitzscaling their way, you know, like, changing our culture, and I'm like, can we apply blitzscaling to social good? That's, there's a purpose there. You know, and asking these questions and why it just dramatically changes the way that we look at every, the way that we look at the idea and the reason why we execute and why we would change direction in the middle of execution. So having that purpose is the most important thing. We have a question back here. Yeah. Over here. Back here. I don't know where here is. Oh, it's way over there. All right. Hello again. Um, a quick question about how, as someone who's on the bottom of the food chain, um, how does that person um, help foster or encourage that culture of freedom of thought mm. and decision making, mm. especially when the folks right. at the top really want to control who's at the bottom? You walk away. So that's what I think, like, to be honest. All right. Because people need you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm telling you. You may want to look at other places. Who will appreciate that? You deserve a better team. Yeah. Mm. All right, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's another question right back here. So this question is um, about grace under pressure. Mm -hmm. um, so being this volunteer, so I got this award, thank you. I was giving up my seat for some of our members to be able to eat earlier. And I walked by and ran into a table that apparently 10 other people had already run into this table. And Sarah was sitting there. Things fall. It gets on her dress. And she was just completely graceful, like wasn't upset, didn't freak out. So the question is for you, Sarah, is how do you remain graceful under pressure, especially when people are wanting you to do all these things and sometimes it doesn't go right or something happens that you didn't expect? Because you were amazing. Like, I had no oh. idea you were one of our guest speakers, and I'm sitting here telling these ladies, I'm like, oh my god, like I like ran into her. I thought it for was really time. funny that you were volunteer of the year <laughs> after you spilled I, I all know, that right. cucumber I soup on my dress. <laughs> and my, I, lo I love for you for coming like, here, up. Take my seat. <laughs> oh my god, it was so funny. And congratulations Thank on your you. award. I mean, again, oh. like round of applause because that is huge. Like volunteering your time for. Um, for an organization, and so especially I. this one for our industry, is, is so important, so thank you. Um, actually, literally, my middle name is Grace. My mom named me Sarah Grace Dewey. <laughs> so, um, so I've had a lot, I've actually had like a lot of conversations around like, what is Grace? And Grace is something, at least in my definition of it, is, is something that's given that's not deserved. Um, and, and, I, and I also, like, I've been there, like I've, I've spilled things on people. I'm a, I was a waitress for like, I don't know, like 20 days before I got fired, you know? So like, you know, like, and it was like, I've done, uh, you know, I've been there. And I think that, um, I don't know, I just, it's not a big deal, right? Like, I think that there's, um, there's, I'm gonna benefit more from being cool with everyone than I am from like getting all huffy and, and mean. I mean, look, you gave me this opportunity to like look like a, wonderful, gracious person because of that, you know? So There you go, karma. Yeah, be cool. <laughs> I think the other neat thing about that, though, is it kind of ties into the leadership, too, right? Like, you also need to give your staff room to not have the perfect moment sometimes, and sometimes those are bad ideas. Sometimes those are when something goes awry at an event, and we need to be graceful as leaders, right? We need to allow people that space a little bit, and I think sometimes we do get in the, doors are gonna open in five minutes, and that person's gonna get fired because the table's not set. So I, I do think that's a great point that you brought up, and thank you, Tiffany. And Hi, my name is Tanya. Uh, thanks for being here. You guys have been talking a lot about change and difference and creativity, but what is the one constant that you consistently bring to the table with your meetings, with your team? What is that one core piece? Uh, discipline. So I think actually like taking all the inputs and everything and, and being disciplined with the way that you um, organize them and put them um, into buckets and things like that is important.